Hello and welcome to Trash Arts Ticks Season 2, Episode 3, with myself Ryan, we got Sam, and we got Jackson. All right. So, as ever, please leave a like, leave a comment as well at the end of the um, episode, let us know what you think, and also please subscribe for more Trash Arts content. Um, on today's show, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with industry. Um, then, actually, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing the filmmaker Dustin Ferguson, who actually runs his own company called uh, SCS Entertainment, based out in LA. Very, very special filmmaker, um, and Sam's worked with him like on numerous different projects over the years. Uh, and then after that, we're actually going to be discussing John Carpenter films, and what kind of makes them special for us, or what doesn't make them special. We'll find out. Anyway... Over to you, Sam, for industry. So there hasn't actually been a lot of industry this week. It's been quite quiet. Um, but at the beginning of the week was Venice Film Festival. They announced their winners. And the winner of Best Film was Nomad Land, which is already being pushed as the potential Oscar frontrunner. This is a film directed by Chloe Zhao uh, with Frances McDormand. The film kind of, because of obviously the situation right now, they screened the film at Venice and Toronto at the same time, and it's getting a New York screening. So it's already been kind of centered as the film of the season. And it sounds like a very good film, and the Metacritic score at the moment is 97 out of 100. And it's that idea of escaping from what America's supposed to be of all the industrialness and just going out in the wild kind of thing. And that story always can bring an appeal, especially right now. So I'm kind of curious to see how far it's going to go, whether it will stick around, because obviously the Oscars is in April 2021. Very strange circumstances, as we know. So will it stay that long? Will it run the whole entire course? We'll see. As far as other film festivals, Toronto is still to reveal their winner, and Netflix have decided not to screen a single one of their films at any film festival whatsoever. So they have, like, tons of potential Oscar films, and... They're just, you're just going to see them when they pop up on Netflix, which I have no problem with. Madonna has decided to direct her own biopic, with, which was co-written with her and Diablo uh, Cody. Diablo Cody wrote Juno and um, Jennifer's Body. My, my major concern with this is that usually when an artist writes a biopic about themselves, you could, you could argue it could be seen as a propaganda piece, because uh, they need to keep their money flowing. How honest can it truly be? Also, Madonna is a terrible director. Everything she's done in the past has been critically hated, and she's never been considered very much talented behind the camera. The other side is to go, all right, maybe she'll actually put some effort in and be brutally honest about who she is. Because she never had effort before. <laughs> you know, I mean, like, Madonna's been around for a long time, and she's had her time where her career was great, and then, and then you know, it slowly got a bit nothingy. And it's just kind of like, if she can be truly honest about who she is, as we've seen recently with music biopics, sure, they make a lot of money, like the Freddie Mercury one, but they're not honest pieces about who the people are. They're just there to keep the band's legacy and the old green dollar flowing. So I'm curious if Madonna's going to take that path or if she's going to go, actually, I'm going to try and make a proper art film of my own life, which could be interesting. But it's probably going to be the dollar, especially with the whole jukebox musicals at the moment. Jake Gyllenhaal is teaming up with Antoine Fuqua. Uh, they recently did the film Southpaw together. Oh, yeah. Anton's, uh, he's done a hell of a lot of films. He's probably best known for Training Day. But they're looking to do a remake of the film called The Guilt. And The Guilt is a Norwegian film, which is all set in, like, um, an emergency services room. And something happens. So it's very, like, um, <laughs> what's that on those boiler room sort of things, where it's all kind of within one location. I haven't seen the film, so I don't know what, it, what, the, what happens in the film. And also, I guess people would like to you know, keep it to watching it. But they've, uh, they've decided to fast track this film because it's all set in one location. Why not, eh? If you can't make things on bigger scales, why not go to those smaller projects that you can get funding for? And this is one of those. And finally, the box office. I'm going to talk about this just because it's interesting and it's kind of depressing for anyone who's hoping cinema's going to rise up. Lower your... Lower that. <laughs> That's not happening. Tenet is, in all accounts, kind of bombing in America. It's made about 30 million. Now, of course, yeah, sure, you can talk about the whole it's COVID, blah, blah, blah. But 70% of cinemas are actually open. Whereas, unfortunately, Disney are doing well. Mulan made 9 million on its first seven days from VOD, 
which is a lot bigger than you know the box office. So their experiment of charging thirty dollars, you all bought it, <laughs> which is insane. It'd be interesting to sort of monetize that because with Mulan, if you think if someone's got Disney Plus, it's within their home, so that could be like a family of three or four that would sit and watch it with their kids. Whereas if you went to the cinema, that's four individual tickets. Yeah, I mean, you, you can play that. I mean, most of VODs, what they really care about is subscribers. They don't really care about numbers. They're just trying to prove that. Oh, it would be interesting to, like, yeah. if, if you were to equate that to what it would be if you took an average household, for example, of being, like, four, and then you were to subsidize that for paying the 20 quid premium fee that it was that... Mm. This is the other thing with Mulan, like, it bombed on the Chinese box office. Yeah. And is it just a reoccurring theme that the box office just isn't strong enough? You could argue that's the case. The other side I'd say is that look at uh, independent horror films this year or a film called Unhinged with Russell Crowe. That film's made about 15 million, which again is not a lot, but compared to the fact that New Mutants has made 13 million and that's just half of what Tenet's done, I think if anything, people are more happy to go for a drive-in to watch something a bit trashy than go to a cinema where you're in a compact environment. So I feel like America Drive-In is going to do very well. But the whole overall picture of cinema at the moment is pretty damn bleak. But what do you expect? It's a pandemic. One other thing to say is the Batman is now back to shooting. There's loads of films that go off and off and with shooting, but yeah. So he's not dead. Mean, yeah, Pattinson's not dead. He's obviously recovered. <laughs> he's been spotted on set. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Sam, for industry. So um, yeah, Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Dustin Ferguson. For you guys out there that might not be aware of Dustin, uh, basically he's a, an LA filmmaker and has been around for quite a good number of years now. Sam's worked with him for I think the last three or four years, am I right? Yeah. And um, yeah, he has a, his own um, film company called SCS Entertainment and has had some really critically uh, acclaimed films that he's created through that um, film company. So yeah, over to you Sam for a cracking interview. Right, I'm on Trash Out's Take with Dustin Ferguson. How you doing, man? You good? I'm doing great. How about you? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing good. Easy day and all that. So, um, <clears throat> let's dive into it. What got you into filmmaking? Well, I guess uh, just being a big horror fan. You know, I grew up um, in the 80s and 90s and video stores were everywhere and it's everything, you know, that I did on the weekends was run a lot of horror movies and became a pretty obsessed fan and towards the end of high school, I kind of started to realize that, you know, when I grew up, I wanted to make horror movies, but, um, you know, I didn't really have any experience in it. And so I decided instead to do the next best thing I thought, which was going to be open a video store. And so I went to college for business management and got my degree for that. But that was in the beginning of the 2000s. And all the video stores here in America were closing then. You know, like uh, everything was transitioning to digital and all of that. Mm. And so instead of opening a video store then, I sort of just ended up working at pizza places as a manager. And then I eventually picked up a camera with my coworkers at that place and went and made a short film called Scalps 2, The Return of DJ, which was like a fan film sequel to Fred Olin Ray's Scalps. And that's kind of what gave me the bug. And then it was interesting because everything came full circle because after a few years, I'd been doing a few short films with eventually some features. And then I was able to open my own video store actually in 2016. And I had it for about 11 months and I ended up selling it to a customer because see, at this point it had been out of time and past that videos were nostalgic. It was sort of like record stores where they were making a comeback and people that are our age have kids now and they want to give them that experience. So I sold it to a customer so that I could move to LA to make movies full time. Mm. So did this lead to like you doing your first feature with Tara Blattery Forrest? Yeah. Um, that, yeah. Okay. So the, what really got my name out there was I had started before I was even filmmaking. I was fan editing. I kind of discovered the fan editing community online. There's a lot of people that, you know, take star Wars and, and movies like that and recut their preferred versions. And I kind of was like the black sheep of that community where I was taking horror films and like reinserting deleted scenes and making extended versions and all that, releasing those for free. And I had done over a hundred of those of different movies that I released for free on the internet. And I had developed a little following for that. And then a guy that was a fan of mine, John Kleiser, um, out of Australia, 
you know, had um, some rights to put out Sleepaway Camp 4, which was a movie that was shot in 1992 but never finished. And so I was brought on then to become an editor um, on that film. And so we developed a relationship then, and I, I worked on that film. And then he ended up writing my first feature film, which was Terror Black Tree Forest. That's fantastic. So how was it like taking on that first production compared to doing the short film? How did you find doing that first feature? Because first features are always a horrible nightmare, especially from the start, from what I remember. Well, you know, it was interesting because really that feature wasn't too different from my first short because um, I had really come out and sort of like explored my surroundings when I had done my first filming on my first short and kind of, you know, discover what was available for me to use. And so when I like, you know, the woods and the different locations and stuff that were around. And so by the time I had done my first feature, Terra Black Chief Forest, we ended up utilizing a lot of that. So in a way, although it was a totally different film, it very much felt like it was just the expanded version of what I had done prior. So for me, it really felt like a natural progression. And um, <clears throat> obviously after this, you know, you've become to the, so prolific. And I know like everybody throws that word around like willy-nilly as much as they want. And I'm, I'm guaranteeing you've probably heard being called prolific before. But what do you, to you as a filmmaker, what does that mean to you when someone says you're a prolific filmmaker? What do you want it to mean towards your output with your career? You know, I don't know. It's interesting because... The, like you said, you know, the term's thrown around a lot, and I think it has a lot of different meanings depending on how it's said and who it's said to, because <clears throat> there's some filmmakers, you know, that are really good and really prolific, and that's what they're known for is their, the art that they create, and then there's people that, you know, churn out a lot of junk because that's just what they want to do, and they're prolific for that too, and I think that, you know, in the beginning, until people really know who you are, they might have certain expectations of you or what they think you are and so obviously I'm known for doing a lot and so I think naturally a lot of people assume what I do isn't very good and so sometimes I think when people are trying to be polite they'll say I'm prolific prolific and so it has a different meaning when that happens versus fans of mine that are you know gushing about my newest movie they're like oh he's so prolific or whatever you know and so it sort of has a double meaning and so to, to me it can mean two different things but in the end, being called one, a prolific filmmaker either way, is an honor because then that does say something. That says that in the very least I'm creating. No, I completely agree. It is like a double-edged sword because it is like, yeah, you're getting as much work out there as possible. But sometimes you feel like some people do just think, well, if he's doing it that quickly, then the skill's getting lost and the thoughts out of each project, which is obviously not the case. Oh, well, and I appreciate you saying that, Sam, actually, you know, and because I mean, I do get that. It's a common thing where I get a lot of remarks about the quality over quantity, you know, because and I understand that because I think that stereotypically that would be true. I think that when things are happening fast and quick that you assume they're cutting corners or, you know, they're cheating their way through it or, you know, they're doing this or that to get it done quick. But really, for me, it's just a unique situation because I've sort of worked myself into this. And I've talked before in previous interviews, you know, when I was working day jobs and stuff, I would get reprimanded a lot at work for being the first one done. People would think I was cheating my way through work or cutting corners to get out early. And it was just because I was efficient. I would develop a system with what I was doing and it worked great and we would get work done quick. And then that just to most people meant that I wasn't doing it right. And so it's interesting that I've kind of carried, you know, my personality hasn't changed. I just brought that into the film world. And so being an efficient filmmaker and being able to get a movie done a month to me seems like nothing because it's all I do. You know, like I get up at 6 a.m. and I start working and I go to bed at 10 o'clock at night and it's all I do. I don't work another job. This is my income. And so I could probably do more than a movie a month. But it's interesting that to most people from the outside, they, they can see that a lot different. Well, the thing is, you know, what you're describing is the dream for every independent filmmaker. It doesn't matter what economic level you're at, that's still some sort of dream to be doing the thing you love, you know? And for some people, it can be something that they might be a little bit annoyed with or have their jealousies, as it were. Yeah, you know, and it's, it's not like I don't understand that, which is what's kind of sad about it, because... 
obviously I don't like intentionally go out to just piss people off. You know, I'm not out like, ah, I'm going to make another movie to laugh at everybody's face, you know, because I think that that's the, the attitude people think I have or something, but it, it's not, you know, it's like, I literally pay my bills this way. Like I have to turn in a movie a month to make the money to pay my rent and my car payment and my dental bill. You know, I mean, I'm just a person living a life and it, it's interesting that, it's, for me, it was never set out that way. Like when I started doing this, I was never like, oh, I'm going to make fast movies. I'm going to pump out 10 a year, all of that. It was never like that. It was just like anybody else. I just started doing my thing. And then it just sort of developed into this because of my own personality. And I think that in a way, then that's that's helped me a lot because it, it's got me here. I mean, like you said, a lot of people crave what I have. And there's no lie about that. Like I, I can wake up and do what I want. I can make any kind of movie I want and get it released and make money from that. I mean, that's what everybody wants. But that's also all anybody sees on the surface. Like people see my Facebook posts, they see the movies come out, they see my trailers, they see the artwork, like, oh, he's living it up, he's at the beach, he's doing this. But that's just the stuff that I share with the public that's part of this persona. Mm. Like they don't see all the hard work, all the rejection, all the tireless hours, the nights I don't sleep, the, the projects that are in LA where I get stuck in six hours of traffic one way and then six hours back home and I get no sleep. You know, I mean, it's like, it's very hard work. And that's why I think it's so desirable because a lot of people really want the fruits of that labor, but it just takes such an investment to get there. And the reality is just not everybody's willing to put that investment in or they just don't have the ability to. No, I, I completely agree with you. And I've always tried to take like the kind of model that you've gone. I've sort of tried to take some attitude of doing a similar thing within Trash Arts or, look, or looking at where you're at and going, this is what we need to be thinking like. And, you know, it's worked so far by following... A similar model to you. <clears throat> Got it. I, 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 I'm glad to hear that. You know, I've heard that often lately, you know, that I've, I've been serving as an inspiration for different people. And really, I'm glad because that's what I want to have happen because I'm not trying to like run the film scene. You know, I'm trying to be the big top director doing all the movies. I'm trying to bring, and you know this, like I'm trying to bring unison with everybody. I'm always trying to involve all these different directors from around the world so we can all get to know each other and not have problems with each other and have fun working together because we're all creating. And I think that that's so important. And I guess it's one of those things that if no one else is doing it, I'll step up and do it and bring people together. And if some people see that as me trying to be dominant or show offy or whatever, then so be it. But I think the people that have worked with me and people like you and, you know, people over the years don't know the real me and they know what I'm about. No, I definitely agree, man. And um, one of the things that, like, when I think of you, I think of you as, as franchises. And I mean that in two regards. I know that you have done work on prolific franchises within different B-movies as, you know, like as a director with the Amityville Horror or as a crew with the Puppet Master film recently. But you've also branded your own franchises that have ranged quite a lot of films. So what does it mean to you, film franchise in that regard? Does, you, does it go back to like your thoughts of, like you said, your love for the 80s kind of films that you just want to be part of that and then create your own legacy with it? Yeah, definitely. You know, and I think a lot of filmmakers say this, you know, that they're just trying to make, you know, the kind of movies that they like growing up. But I mean, that's true. That's why I do it. Like when I started this, in the early 2000s, filmmaking, like the independent horror scene was kind of dry. There was a lot of crappy, you know, direct-to-video movies that were like showing up on video store shelves that just weren't very good. And there was, not, everything just felt dried up kind of after screen for a while, you know, like things had really changed. And I had the attitude that I wasn't satisfied with a lot of the stuff that was coming out, other than obviously the big major stuff. And so I wanted to sort of do something for myself to keep it alive. And so like when I started making my stuff, I never, I've said this recently before in interviews, that I never meant to release it to the public. Like, I was always originally making movies strictly for myself to watch. Like, I wanted to make things that I knew I would enjoy that felt like an old movie because they don't make old movies anymore. And nobody makes those types of movies because the style of filmmaking's changed, camera qualities have changed, everyone's changed. And so there was sort of like this whole thing that was lost. And I felt sad about that. And so I started making movies and I started just screening them for the people that were involved in the films only and then selling copies to them out of the trunk of my car. And so that's literally what I was doing, like in front of the theater. And it just got to a point where I just kept getting more encouragement from people to show them more, to release them and, and get them out there. And so that's sort of like, you know, how that happened. But it really never was my intention. It was really just because I am a horror fan. And so I feel like 
movies like Me Hook Massacre that have all the sequels and stuff like that, kind of like what you said, it's really just my way of keeping something alive. I think it's great though, because it is something that's lost a bit within horror, and uh, you got a hell of a lot of franchises out there. Yeah, well, and it's again, it's it's for multiple reasons. You know, it's for me, but now it's for to help other people. I mean, I get these other directors I bring in for the Me Hook Master films, or like you for Terra Proxy Forest, mm. and you know all these other projects because it it really sort of brings us all together. Because when you think about it. Like the amount of things like that I've done, you know, that have brought in all these different people has just created so many connections and so much more work for other people that just wouldn't have been there otherwise. And that's really why I'm doing it. And again, it is kind of like the old school how they used to in the 80s. It's not like obviously every Friday the 13th or every Nightmare on Elm Street was a different director who was looking for their way to forage, you know, to not forage, but their own creative spin or their own stamp on that film and to have the support from the network of the legacy of that film, you know? Yeah, no, exactly. That's exactly the reason I'm doing it is for that exact reason, because it opens up, you know, the films to more of an audience like, it, you know, every director that's attached is going to bring their own flavor to it. That's going to keep it interesting. It's not going to be a retread of what I've done because I'm going to make the same kind of film, you know, and people, if they're going to be watching part eight of something, they want a little variety. You know, and, and people can bring different things to the table, which brings a different type of film for each installment, which is what makes it good. You know, and so I think it's really important to do that just as a whole. No, I, I completely agree. And this kind of obviously has led on recently to having uh, SCS Entertainment and having its own like kind of VOD site. It's, it's pretty damn impressive. And you obviously opened that door to other independents as well that aren't necessarily just doing it for either remake or part of your own legacy. You're allowing other artists to kind of showcase themselves. So how did that start? Yeah. Well, it was just, I guess, the, the next step, you know, the progression of what I had been doing. Like, I, the first, you know, quote-unquote label I had was RHR Home Video, which was the abbreviation of Retro Horror Remix, which was my fan editing label online. And so I feel like every few years, you know, I sort of transition and, and start doing bigger films and, and go to the next step. So every time I sort of reinvent my label as to what it is I'm doing. And so when I moved to California uh, three years ago, uh, I had rebranded as SoCal Cinema Studios. And then it was just such a mouthful to say, <laughs> and I felt like it didn't necessarily have the, the professional ring to it I wanted, so I, I kind of abbreviated it into the SCS Entertainment, because that just sounds more Hollywood, you know? <laughs> and so I think that, that when I did that was sort of what made me realize that I've got to really grow it, you know? Like, if I wanted to be the next Roger Corman Studios or the next Full Moon, it can't just be me making all the movies. You know, I've got to... In the past, I brought in other filmmakers for little things, but let's really grow it, you know? Let's really make this a team and a family and so that all these filmmakers are connected to SCS and then we are a real brand that people recognize and when our stuff comes out, they anticipate it. And I think that's what you've been able to grow. There is always that... There's that direct closeness with the fans. I mean, even the fact that you're doing your own award ceremony. It just gets people a little yeah. bit closer and, you know, it's it's a lovely thing. Well, I think that's so important. I mean, because as a horror fan myself, you know, growing up one, you know, you, you look up to the stars and the people you admire and you always want them to treat you nice if you were to meet them and be inspiring and all of that. And so it, I really take that to heart because in like the social media age where you're just like a click away from anybody, you know, I post something and all these people I don't even know, like I don't even know them, though, mm. you know, hundreds of comments sometimes. And I make a point to thank everybody because that's just so crucial. And then when people feel like they're your friend, they want to support you because you're their friend. And so I've gotten, you know, throughout the years doing this, all this league of people that I can count on, on every movie I release. And so it's sort of like I built this thing that I've set myself up to be able to do it full time simply by be, being good to my fans and really giving them just what they want. I completely agree and you, you can see it. Um, do you have a particular film, do you have like a favorite film of yours or one that you're like extremely proud of? <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know. It, you know, it's funny because I shift around, you know, like it, usually it's the most current movie because it's the one I'm the most proud of. You know, it always seems like it's the step up from the last one. Yeah. And so like, you know, I'm real happy, you know, with like a Bolorex and a Racknado because we started doing a lot of new things I haven't done before, like the CGI and getting second and third unit to film things. And I feel like we've really grown with those movies. Um, but like Nemesis 5, I can't say that 
I'm extremely proud of the film itself because I know that we were super limited and there was just a lot going on when we made that. But it is the film that got me to L.A. It's the film that changed my life. Mm. And so I feel like I owe a lot to it. So I'll probably always fall back on that one as my answer. No, that makes sense. Like, I remember the, the buzz. It's weird with things, isn't it? When you've known someone quite a while on social media, you do see that slow building of the career. And as I saw you when, you when you went over to L.A. from 2017. And then, yeah, the love for that film. And because our uh, mutual friend Robbie Hampstead loves the Nemesis series. So he was telling me about yeah. it. And I was like, oh, I know the director. It's, uh, it's becomes this weird small world, especially with such an international difference as well. Yeah, no, you know, and I think about that a lot. Like when I made my post about you earlier today, I was really thinking about it, you know, that throughout the years that I've been doing this, you know, people come and go, but I notice the people that stick around, you know, like I remember talking to you years ago and the people that are still today liking my posts, you know, it's like that, that really to me is what, and a lot of, it sounds silly, but that is my drive. Like, you know, I think that creative people come from difficult backgrounds, you know, and it sort of molds you into the person that you are. And I didn't have the most ideal background. I didn't get a lot of encouragement growing up or recognition for anything. And so I, that's what I'm lacking. You know, that's my fault as a person that I need validation sometimes to feel okay and what I'm doing and reassured. And when just a fan tells me they love my movie or, you know, they're excited for something, they have no idea that that's probably causing me to go make my next movie, you know? And so it really is something that I cherish. And I know that I wouldn't even be this far without my fans. That's it. Sometimes, sometimes it's easy just to forget how important fandom is. And you can see, you can see all the love around you and you do give so much back to the fans, which is great. And then, uh, last question I've got for you. And essentially I asked this, first, this question to everyone, but it's kind of curious to ask with you because you obviously produce quite a lot when you want, but if you had that ultimate budget of like, I say, whatever n number was necessary, what would be that dream project? <laughs> I can never answer this question right because I always fall back on, I would just make a bunch of small movies, <laughs> you know, and that's just, <laughs> that's just the business sense, you know, talking. I think that like if I had a gun to my head, they're like, spend this million dollars or we're going to kill you. I would probably just make an action epic, you know, because I mean, I love action films. I love psych because everybody thinks I'm all about horror and I am. I mean, horror is my favorite, but I, I'm multidimensional. Like I like comedies. I like action movies. I like sci-fi. And that stuff often is harder to do on a lower budget to make it good, you know, to have the kind of effects you need and stunt work and locations. And so it's not something I can always easily pull off. So I feel like if I had just a ton of money, was forced to blow it on a movie, I'd just make a crazy ass action movie. That'd be cool, man. I guess one day that opportunity will pop up. Does that mean you'd want to do like a, a big kind of a franchise action film? Something that's got <clears throat> a bit of a... Yeah. Is there any particular... Yeah, something along the lines of like, you know, Robocop or Term... Because, I mean, I did it on a small scale with Robo Woman, obviously, mm. but it, I want something that's... Because that's how I am. I am very franchise oriented and branching out and all of that. So I like something that could be the foundation of something bigger that, you know, that has a really powerful story. Like I'm very, I get lost in all of the movies I release, you know, like as soon as I release a movie, I'm on to the next one. I don't get a lot of time to reflect on things. Like my manager's always telling me that I, I'm never promoting my own movies because I'm already, you know, off to the, to the next thing. But I think that going back when I reflect on things, I, I was actually doing that a lot recently that I really enjoy the storytelling aspect of it. And that's something that's hard to do properly and convey in a movie if you don't have the right budget. So I think that, yeah, it would be really important for me to make something that had a very solid, you know, sort of foundation, something that could grow in. Now, I'm not trying sure to say I want to make the next Star Wars or something, but something that people cherish and find to be important. No, no, I completely respect that, man. And you, you, I always see entertainment as being quite a strong thing with it. And you do build this like mythology with the storytelling. So, I, you know, that opportunity will come up at some point with that big budget. And uh, I hope it. I hope you get it, basically. But um, yeah. I hope so too. I appreciate that. No worries, man. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, I wish you complete luck with all the projects you've got coming up with Amterville in the hoods, and so many more that it's just hard to keep naming them all. Like you said, you know. But it's absolutely fantastic. <laughs> and if people want to check um, 
SCS Entertainment, of course, you can check out the VOD site and see all their work. We'll make sure to put a link on either the screen right now or just in the information. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. I really appreciate it. No worries, man. You have a good evening. You as well. Bye-bye. So, thanks for that, Sam. Really interesting. And so this week, guys, we decided that we wanted to take a little bit of a delve into John Carpenter films and what we think of them, whether it be positive or negative, and what kind of impact it's had on us. So for me personally, my first ever experience of a John Carpenter film is Halloween. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that would be a lot of people's experience. And it's the first one, I think it's the first film that he put his stamp, you know, it says John Carpenter's Halloween. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think actually uh, the first John Carpenter film I saw was The Fog, but my dad just loved The Fog. So I always uh... forget about The Fog. <laughs> <laughs> was that, that was the 80s as well, wasn't it? 1980. Yeah, it mm. was, yeah. But yeah, with uh, Halloween, Halloween was one of those like opportunities that completely broke him. It was, he had about 200 grand to make a, a babysitter horror movie. And the rest is history. Yeah, he completely invent well, he completely invented at least an American genre within slasher films. Um, it was also Halloween was co-written with by Debbie Hills, she, so it wasn't completely Carpenter. But what he did is he introduced his particular style. He's got a big thing for big old wide angles. He loves a wide angle, and um, I remember hearing him on an interview with Eli. I think it was Eli Roth or Robert Rodriguez, one of them, where he talked about Steadicam and how he loves Steadicam. And the first time he saw a Steadicam, we went, oh, this could be really good, to, uh, was uh, The Exorcist 2. The apparently there's a Steadicam shot at the opening, and he thought, that's how I want to shoot Halloween. And after that, that's pretty much John Carpenter's style. Yeah. But I think, I think John Carpenter's style sort of comes... Uh, there, there's many aspects to it, because obviously one of the main things that people think about when they watch Halloween or any Carpenter film is the music. The that's music is so... He scored it as to, well, didn't he? ...to the atmosphere mm. and to everything, and it's so cool at the same time. Um, and I don't know quite how he manages to make it creepy and cool. That's... Well, I suppose it's because John Carpenter is always considered an American independent filmmaker... I know that sounds weird to say, but it's because he independently does so much himself. And um, when it comes to music in particular, like he's very, he likes to make sure he can control it because he's the one who's shot the scene and he knows how much more emotion he needs to pull out with the music. Mm. Like as, um, again, this, this, this video I was watching of him talking about it, the particular scene in Christine where they're just talking in a car. Christine is his Stephen King film. And it's a very slow, dull scene, but he said he just put a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of synth underneath, and it just brought it up. It just brought you more into what they were actually talking about. Like, <coughs> what's interesting with John Carpenter, and uh, you probably wouldn't experience it with any um, production these days, is that initially he did have quite a lot of creative control. Yeah. So in terms of he's directing the film, he wrote, well, co-wrote, um, but then he's putting his own ideas into the music. Well, he, he's getting everything that he wants out of it. He wanted his auteur stamp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the auteur theory, um, he wanted to be like, you know, like the, either the early 70s guys or the European filmmakers who did have that creative control. And it, unfortunately, it led to his kind of downfall in the 90s where he just kept fighting studios to get yeah. creative control in his films. I think studios sort of horribly. started taking over, didn't they? And wanting more control over the... It's interesting though, because with John Carpenter as well, obviously you've got all of the aspects of him putting uh, so much into it and doing different aspects of the filmmaking itself. But um, I think that his marketing campaign, in terms of himself, was phenomenal as well because he stuck his name, you know, in, the, in the yeah. title of every single film he did, and he really um, drove it home. Yeah, got got that into everyone's minds. I imagine there were other filmmakers that were doing similar things where they were working on so many aspects of it. Um, but I think that that sort of like, uh, you know, the name always being presented up front um, is, is a powerful tool. Well, that's it. Compare it to the other American auteurs at the time. No one goes Steven Spielberg's Jaws. Mm -mm. John Carpenter wanted it that, that author, like, like an author, like a book, the stamp on it. And to the point where even with Christine, which was written by Stephen King, John Carpenter still got his name on it, even though it's a Stephen King film. And this is the mid-80s. Stephen King was gold back then, you know? I think um, John Carpenter is also someone who's always tried to tell very... Stories at the time, like, with, in the particular, let's look at the They Live. Mm. They Live is a film that was so way ahead of its time, but also was completely about that 80s consumerism and all that yuppie culture. 
and just being like, maybe we should look a little bit further into this and realize that we're controlled by a, a ruling rich elite, which of course, in his fantastical way, he's gone with aliens with it. But that, that idea resonates throughout time. But like all John Carpenter films, it bombed. The guy has had so many box office bombs. It's kind of strange. This is the guy who literally broke records with Halloween. Did um, Escape from New York, which again got him a lot of an audience. And then The Thing came along and The Thing bombed like crazy. Like nobody went and watched it because it was the summer of E.T. I was just going to say we've discussed this before, haven't we? And it came <laughs> yeah. out around the same time as E.T. It's just every time he's tried to actually put fully who he is. And another good example is uh, Big Trouble in Little China. Another bomb. These are so individually creative films that are from him. And an audience will click on later on like great art does. And that's the funny thing with him. Although he is a genre director, to me he kind of falls into being more of an art director because his work is so not understood at the time and it takes a bit of time to really see everything. To, to ask you a question on that point, do you think, because of the success of Halloween, what, 1977, I believe? 1978? Um, because of the success, he kind of dug his own grave a little bit because of everything else that came out after that wasn't necessarily in the same format as Halloween. I disagree. I think with Halloween, because it was such a low budget and it made so much money and nobody expected it, that he then had the opportunity to tell the stories he wanted to tell. Yeah, but I mean, from a, an audience perspective, because it's not going to be exactly the same as what Halloween was. So like Christine wasn't, The Fog isn't. Well, it's, it's, audiences are weird, yeah? Like, because it doesn't mean, because the people didn't turn up to the cinema doesn't mean that the audience wasn't there, if that makes sense. It's just at the time, watching, and you gotta remember, his films aren't for children, they're R-rated. So they're going to be for more of an adult audience. To oh go yeah, to absolutely. Cinema. I feel like things like The Thing, The Thing is a bleak film. And sometimes people don't want to have that bleak experience. Yeah, but initially, whenever it first came out, you're not going to know that it's a bleak film. You only really the know marketing. That. Yeah. And the initial reviews, because it still exists. It's still the 80s. They still had, like, what's that guys called? Uh, Roger and Eskel. Those two guys who used to do the thumbs up, thumbs down. All oh, that shit. kind of format was there. So they was constantly giving you, you know, what film's coming out. And John Carpenter's films used to get... Generally speaking, he's just not been critically acclaimed. So, what do you think? Now. What do you think is the major reason for that? Um, I think it's that he was doing something that was uh, a lot of his films had a, a certain artistic point to them, but they they explored it in a bit of a trashy horror way. Um, mm. uh, less so the thing, I would say. The thing feels much more classic to me. But when you think about Halloween, The Fog, um, They Live. Um, these are quite sort of uh, trashy films in some ways, but they have so much depth and meaning to them behind them in the subtext. And that's what I think John Carpenter did so well. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's probably What's why that? it didn't do too well at the time. Yeah. If you're, if you're difficult as well as a filmmaker, your film might get a little bit buried. So being released at certain times, I'm not saying that every studio has its vindictive nature, but you can kind of like not put it at the right time when that film should be released. I, I would argue and the that. thing was released in summer. Yeah. Why would you release a film that's completely winter based in the middle of summer? Yeah, but then that's, that's 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 a dumb release date. That's silly. That's that's a carpet. Um, sorry, that's a company not knowing how to promote a film. Mm. And I think that's John Carpenter's biggest problem. Generally speaking, it should be quite easy to market him, but at that time it wasn't. And I think at film studios as well. Um, give them credit where credit's due we're still finding their feet of like bigger films like um so to really identify where it's gonna fit well, especially with other films that are coming out that are big blockbusters i mean this in no negative way they were looking for their next indiana jones and next star wars yeah because this is this is the 80s the prime blockbuster season the um the interesting thing is though you have some of the best horror directors and genre directors who came out of the 80s who were making more independent films um, and Carpenter's, he's, he's quite high on that list. And he didn't care. Like, I, I think he was just happy to still be able to make the film. He didn't care how much money they made. It, w it wasn't important to him. Problem is, is that when he head, head into the 90s, I don't know, maybe he, stood, he cared less because those films just got worse in quality. He wasn't not working. He was consistently working all the way up until Ghost of Mars. He was still consistently working. But did he change, like, labels? It's not a question, I mean, I don't know which studios every single film's from. It's more of a question of how much did he care to like really 
because like I don't know it's a weird thing when it comes to horror directors the older they get the less the quality of the work seems to be there sometimes. I mean... I'll remember that, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> we all love Wes Craven, but Wes Craven's later stuff isn't very good. And it's like, was there, a, was there a sense of urgency when they were at that point where they were like, this is a story I'm telling. Yeah, and I'm slowly I don't know. climbing. It might, it might not be to do with age. It might be to do with sort of like uh, how, um, how involved with the world that they are. Because as you get success and as you get money and as you get further, like you, you're going to be less um, aware of what's going on in mm. day-to-day lives. And I think that's where horror really comes from, is yeah. is seeing what people are, are afraid of and what, what affects people at that time. This is it, you're right. And the, the fact is, in the 80s, Carpenter was focusing on actual things that he was you know thinking about, whereas... A lot of his 90s films, they're reboots of other horror films. Mm. So there was an Invisible Man reboot, there was The Village of the Damned, there was a Lovecraft film. They're just films that was people it a skip forget. from LA? Was that? Yeah, again, and I, I'm, I'm not going to watch that because I've, I've heard it's awful. And I don't like the words awful next to John Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I have a, I'm really happy with his attitude to how people take him now. Now he is respected. And because he's still alive, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but a lot of the horror icons, they, you know, they left us last few years. Toe Hooper, George A. Romero, Wes Craven. These guys aren't there anymore, and they're the legends who are the same class, you know? Mm. Carpenter, he's just in a legend state now, and he loves just doing music and playing computer games and now and then coming on and producing films. But for a long time, he was a miserable bastard. <laughs> his, his, in the 2000s, you saw more remakes of his films. If anyone remembers, it was a remake of The Fog. Yeah, I, I don't remember that actually. Yeah, and he was not happy that that happened because he had no creative influence. No one ever asked him like, so he just went. The money turned up, and that's that. And that's got to be a really weird feeling because, for one, especially if it's a film that's grown in time and been beloved, but kind of bombed at the beginning, you're just seeing it as someone's done a, a carbon copy but with terrible CGI and none of the skill that Carpenter brought. Because that's the one thing people do sort of forget with Carpenter. He's an incredibly talented filmmaker. The fight sequence in They Live. Yeah. Mm. Everyone's parodied that to death. No. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> is, it that whole, uh, is it the chicken in Stanley Guy? Uh, yeah, That's they, did, they off did it in South Park. Yeah, yeah they yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you first see that scene, and you're not even taking consideration of the time, you might be told of the legend of it's 11 minutes long. I remember Carpenter said in his script that it just said fight continues for like 10 pages just fight continues fight continues and there's a real like naturalism to it it's a way to beef out the script but there's one shot like I think it's inside the bin where the bin starts to like come up as they're like they're inside the, they're either fighting or it's just at the end where they're grabbing for the, the glasses and it's just such a cool shot and he's he's always trying to do something a bit dynamic with his camera work you know it's quirky. never it's not, not quirky it's, it's more that there's it, there's control to it and you can see like when he does those long drawn out wide shots and he's slowly moving with you he knows where he's going to end up it's all going to be one smooth transition to that point mm. and um, I think Carpenter does a, a lot of work with that and he's also someone who, who seems to be very keen on trying to shoot um, on location because the thing was shot I believe not in the Antarctica of course but I believe it was shot in Alaska so that whole environment's real and they're all, they're all like group together and experiencing it together and I think Carpenter tries to keep things as real as possible even in the small way of um, The Prince of Darkness now The Prince of Darkness is a weird weird film it's, a, it's about a prophecy that essentially the, the devil's coming and he's like this green goo and all the scientists and all the students have to get together to work out the puzzle which again kind of fixate on the whole 80s paranormal scene but the very fact that they they it has a weird logic to it, you know. You, you, it's, so he's he's fought it through quite. I don't know. It's quite a developed story for something that's very strange and kind of ridiculous, but still incredibly effective. Just bringing it back to Halloween, I think if memory serves me right, he did the first three. No. Oh. He directed the first one. Um, I believe he might be involved with the writing of the second one, and then the third one he scored. He probably produced the, the first of the couple ones. His actual original idea of Halloween was to keep it anthology based, hence why the third one's mental. As fuck all to do with Michael Myers and goes on its own strange little journey. That's because that's what John Carpenter wanted to do. John Carpenter got a disdain towards the Halloween franchise. He didn't like it because they just kept getting worse and worse and worse. 
I mean, we'll save that for our big old Halloween chat that we're going to have next month. But later on, of course, with the Halloween remake, um, Danny McBride's David Gordon Green and Jodie Hill, when they pitched their Halloween remake, they actually listened to Carpenter. And like I said, no one listens to Carpenter when it comes to remakes. That's why he came on to produce it, and that's why he was like, yeah, I'll score it. He, had a res he saw that they had a respect for the work, and he was more likely to be cooperative. It's the same reason why he's more cooperative about working on The Thing, because Bloomhouse is behind it, and he's seen that Bloomhouse did something very special with Halloween. Um, so really, yeah, he's not really been a, a big fan of that franchise because of where it took it. Because in the first Halloween, of course, it's not even revealed that it's his, um, that he's her brother. That was added on the second one. Like, that wasn't his intention. His intention was that it was just this evil that's not supernatural but not uh, human at the same time. It's just invincible and it's going to keep going, keep like hitting it. And it's interesting that they obviously had to personalize it so they can keep using Jamie Lee Curtis and keep her start going. Well, I think that there's been a change in the in the horror industry recently, where like you know you've you've seen more um, studios that are willing to give the creators um, what they want um, and not try to interfere too much, like Blumhouse and um, mm. yeah, that's working at least on the majority of it. It's working quite nicely. Mm. I think yeah, and the most of those filmmakers that are coming up, they they are, they owe a lot to John Carpenter, and they and they owe a lot to those eighties and seventies directors. And again, Carpenter would probably say that a lot of his work comes from the filmmakers of the fifties and the sixties. You know, there's always that. It's almost like if you have a respect for authorship, you're going to try and keep control over what you're doing. And I think that is the key thing with John Carpenter's work. He has always seemed to have a respect for the concept of what an auteur is, and it's not always worked out well for him to try and keep that control. And it seemed like at some point he just stopped trying to control and just... I think with Carpenter, he, it's, it's also unfortunate because the guy is so... He's a master of genre, yeah? There's a film called um, Assault at Precinct 13. And it is so good. It's one of those siege films. Like the typical thing of there's a guy in a prison and this gang need to get to him so the cops have got protected. So it almost becomes like a western. And in a weird way, his films always... I think it's that wideness of the shot and that kind of thing, like they always do go back to that old John Ford kind of 50s Western stuff, which is probably what John Carpenter was kind of, you know, brought up on probably. But he, he's such a master of genre that it's unfortunate that he got so lost, you know? He should have technically, if he wasn't so his way, been like Spielberg, he could have been one of those kind of guys, you know? Or um, a Verhoeven or someone like that, but one of the 80s guys who just kept producing and getting bigger. Or a James Cameron. How John Carpenter didn't get as much success as James Cameron is bizarre. I just think it's interesting that he's just the way he stuck to his guns did affect his career in a negative, and that and that's a sad thing. It did, but, but then I now think it ultimately, it's respected. Yeah. yeah, I think ultimately because he stuck his guns, um, he's revered around the world now as being a real good alter mm. creator, and and yeah. it's what's defined him. I think the, um, there was something that there's a quote from John Carpenter where he says that. France sees me as an art director, Britain sees me as a filmmaker, and America sees me as a horror director. <laughs> it pretty much says it all, you know? Yeah. 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 As you were talking about that, um, uh, you know, that classicness, I just had uh, flashes of those, uh, some of the, the scenes from um, The Fog and how it was just like, I mean, it, it, where it's set in that, like, town, that, that uh, town area, mm. it's so uh, small. And so, you know, you're seeing the radio station, you're seeing the house, you're seeing people darting about the town kind of thing, trying to get to different places or do different things. Um, and, you know, with that moment with the fog sort of coming in, it just, it did feel classic like that. And I think that's something that Carpenter always brings is like that, yeah, classic, Almost classic the, imagery. The use of epics, like you think like David Lean, John Ford, all those guys back in the day who just did the big epics and they'd be on the widest scale possible. And also the fog is like, for me, it's quite. It's a film that can easily make you feel quite tired, but it is one of the most atmospheric films ever made. It it's is. so it's it's very very slow. Um, mm. But then then that's sort of the nature of the whole idea of it in the first place is that fog of not being able to see, you know, moving through yeah. a fog that's unclear and stuff. I think fogs are pretty slow. Yeah, yeah, they don't tend to move. Yeah, <laughs> quickly. <laughs> Off you go now, fog. <laughs> Weird that John Carpenter and people like that don't get that respect. Yet we look at Martin Scorsese. 
Scorsese can do what the fuck he wants. He wants 250 million to make someone look like they're 20 well, when they're actually 70. Technically, technically, he didn't get what he wanted, and that's why he went to Netflix. But he still could go to he Netflix. Still, yeah, but he still got it in the end. Um, but. What, uh, what I was going to say about that is, um, do you think that's because of uh, John Carpenter's, uh, the fact that he, he, he always has a, a flop at the box office? It's not it, it, like all he did for a long time. Um, and that's perhaps why the studios came because you know the studios are essentially looking to make money, aren't they? Yeah. So, the, do they trust the, them enough? Do, well, are they going to like come in and try to think like, well, we know that he's got a popular name, and we're just going to try and capitalize off that, rather than go, here's your cre-, you know, do what you do, um, create what you create. If we look at the um, going back to the auteur times of those filmmakers. It, you're right, it's definitely to do with how many successes have they had. Mm. You look at uh, Coppola, Francis Ford Coppola, Godfather, and you've got Father 2, the, well, the conversation as well, and then you did Apocalypse Now. And that's within a 10 year period. After that, you could do whatever the fuck you wanted. And those films did make money, and they were successful and legendary. John Carpenter has Halloween, successful, and then The Fog, which was successful, Escape from New York, successful, and then nothing else was really successful after that. In a prime time when 80s was pure capitalistly driven, I think because of his determined nature, that's why he didn't get to have those positions that Scorsese got to do. Yeah. And again, because he's a genre filmmaker, that's going to be a problem as well. Whereas Scorsese, from the beginning of 70s until, well, throughout, has always had at least, an, even if it's not every film's a success, there's going to be more hits than miss. Especially at the box office. I just feel John Carpenter's like, He's also just an American guy, yeah. Like Scorsese has his um, cultural identity by being American Italian, so there's always that kind of respect there and that kind of thing. And other directors have a similar thing, but Carpenter's just an American guy who likes to do the fuck he wants to do. And I think he's kind of difficult in that respect, and I respect and love the fact that he was difficult, but. Yeah, it's but the, I, th- I think that's the thing, isn't it? When they when they come in on you like for for uh, not making enough money. Uh, if you try to if you tried to hold on to that kind of control, you can you can see why the set might get a bit messed up in terms mm. of who's calling the shots. You know, do the ac- uh, do the actors know what's going on? Do the produ- whose sides are the producers on? It's it becomes suddenly messy. messy and and with disagreements and stuff like yeah. that because of that involvement. That ultimately, is going to affect the production. Of course, unfortunately, all turf theory doesn't usually fit in with studios. No, and they don't like it. And Carpenter's one of those guys that they just go, all right, well, fuck you. Even if he was working with not one of the biggest actors, but one of the bigger names with uh, Kurt Russell. I mean, with five films together, you know, and yeah, still. That was his go to guy. It's yeah. always sat with an odd way, that, uh, an odd way to judge a film for me is, is how much money they make at the box office because surely there's more of a, a scope for some of these films. You're afterwards. right. Like, again, let's look at art house drama, yeah? Art house drama doesn't make money. It's not designed to make money. It's there to be appreciated and win awards. If a genre pick that has art house leanings but doesn't make any money, then it's a failure. It's a weird one, but we allow dramas because they're, they're attempting for awards and you can get those actors and everyone's happy with it. But if a, an ambitious genre piece fails and we go, oh, well, that director's done. But it made the same money as that little art house drama. And it's not even a question, like John Carpenter didn't even work on like, the biggest budgets. He didn't need to. He knew his shit, you know, he, he never went, from what I know at least, I don't think he had any, I think the biggest budget he ever worked with was Mission to Mars. Ghost to Mars, sorry. Mission to Mars? Like, <laughs> That's a different you film. just made another film. Well, there's loads of Mars <laughs> films around that time. But that film's considered, like, awful. Mm. And it's probably because he got too much money to do too much with it and still had studio expectations at the same time. I think for him, if he ever does make another film, and he says he does want to make another film, he needs to just work for a studio that trusts him. How old is he now? Carpenter must be... Oh. In his 70s? He's either 70, 71, or he's like 69. He's, he's in that bit. That's why right. he's a little bit younger than the other guys. You could still make it. you got Scorsese rocking about, making The Irishman. Like. Yeah, it's just whether he'll do something good. And now the box office is dead anyway, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Prime time. I think John Carpenter would actually benefit mostly if he attempted to do a TV series. Now, he did do an anthology series called um, Masters of Horror came out in 2000 he did like two episodes for that I think but to see him actually do a TV series where a TV series where he's the showrunner 
and he has creative control. Could be like how Lynch thrives more when he's got that creative control on a TV show because he can do whatever the fuck he wants. I'd be very interested to see if Carpenter would completely thrive in that environment. More so than unfortunately he's been allowed to in film. Yeah. So just to finalise, guys, would you say John Carpenter is a hit or a miss for yourselves? That's a really weird question. <laughs> <laughs> so is he like <clears throat> are you a fan of him or I love are you John not? Carpenter. He's, a, he's an amazing author and he stuck to his guns but it gave him a little bit of a shitty point but if you think of that golden 74 to 80, 89 it's all gold I think I think John Carpenter's done something very clever where when you're discussing uh, you know him he, he stands out as much more of an individual because of the way that he marketed himself as sort of mm. the lead on these films and because he, he had his name on the titles um uh, so I feel like it, it, it's a weird one. I'm a big fan of his, but I can see exactly how he, he his career led to the, where it did and, and where he sort of failed kind of thing. And I don't particularly want to watch the films of his that aren't um, well respected because... Yeah, none of his. It, 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 it worries me. I don't want to see Carpenter do that. <laughs> essentially, that whole author kind of stamp that is Carpenter isn't there, mm. and that's where you feel that disappointment, and you wonder, did he care enough to fight for that stamp, or did he just go, fuck it, I need to make sure I paid away. See, so, yeah, I, I'm a bit like you, Jackson, in, in as much as whenever I see a John Carpenter film, and it's like, like you say, Sam, in between sort of that 1974. Um, right up until 1989 you're kind of like oh yeah I'll watch that I'll give it a watch because it's gold it's really good mm. but anything thereafter I'm always a bit dubious and even now like if he was to make another film I would kind of be a bit on the fence I'd probably watch it just because it was John Carpenter but at the same time it's kind of you've got that bit in the back of your head that's like mm, is this going to be would, any good or? I would totally judge it on the uh, the studio that he was working with to be honest yeah yeah that would be that's... interesting Netflix just give him 300 million <laughs> That's <laughs> mental. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back Carpenter. Um, anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed this podcast this week. Um, as ever, please leave a like, leave a comment if you want to discuss any John Carpenter films or just your thoughts on today's episode. Uh, and please subscribe as ever and check out our website. It's www.trasharts.co.uk and where you can keep up to date with a load of our content as well as on the YouTube channel. So like I say, please subscribe. Other than that, guys, thanks for listening. Trash Arts Take Out. Bye-bye. Ta-da.